Greetings to each and every one of you. My name is Paul Andre Durache. I'm the Archbishop of Gatineau and the Apostolic Administrator of Mont Laurier. Today is Saturday, May 23rd, the Saturday of the sixth week of Easter. And together we continue our reading of the Acts of the Apostles and of the Gospel of John as they are proposed to us in the daily liturgy of the Eucharist. Um, we are at Acts, the 18th chapter of the book of Acts, verses 23 to 28. Um, we saw yesterday how Paul left uh, Corinth after having built up the church there and leaving Corinth, he headed uh, towards uh, Palestine. Actually, he went to Jerusalem first and then down to Antioch and in Antioch spends quite some time, probably, a, you know, a year, we could think. And then he undertakes a third uh, missionary trip, you could say. If you remember, he did a, a first tour, you know, in close to um, w what we would call southern, uh, uh, southern Turkey today and middle Turkey. And this time, uh, and then the second trip, he went all the way into Greece and then came back. And now third trip, he's going to go back towards Greece, going through Turkey, uh, through the land route rather than through the sea. So after spending some time at Antioch, Paul departed and went from place to place through the regions of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. So again, this is a kind of a pastoral visit. He's visiting the communities he founded. He's spending time with them. He's helping them to grow in the faith and in their understanding of the good news of Jesus. Now, uh, Luke leaves Paul up in Phrygia and, and Galatia. We leave him for a bit. The first time in a few chapters that we're going to leave Paul aside. And he introduces a new character. There came to Ephesus, where Paul had just been through, you know, well, just the year before, before heading back towards Palestine. He had been to Ephesus. So there came to Ephesus a Jew named uh, Apollos, a native of Alexandria. Uh, he was an eloquent man, well-versed in the scriptures. Now, Alexandria was a center of how could you say Greek Jewish culture you know the the Jews uh, had translated their scriptures into Greek they studied the scriptures in Greek uh, they worshiped in Greek and they lived their faith in a very Greek milieu quite different from uh, Jerusalem and he has come from there and he was eloquent so he was obviously for the Greeks, being eloquent may, meant being trained, uh, being mastering the skills of oratory, um, probably a very intelligent man if he was well-versed in the scriptures. So he's a, a remarkable person. He, was an, uh, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. So, so he's, he's a follower of Jesus. The way is the, the name that Luke gives to the early church. He gave it in Antioch, the way, and here he uses the same expression. So in the way of Jesus, he'd been instructed and he spoke with burning enthusiasm and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. Is, you know, so, so he's uh, obviously enthralled by the teaching of Jesus and by whom Jesus is. But he only knew the baptism of John, which is interesting. If, if you remember, uh, at one point, Peter and the apostle John going into Samaria and meeting some early Christians, and they had only ba been baptized, you know, in the name of Jesus, and uh, Peter and John laid hands upon them so that they would receive the Spirit. So it seems that uh, uh, Apollos, sorry, that Apollos wasn't, uh, wasn't aware of this, or at least had not experienced this. Uh, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, boldly, you know, with parresia, as, as the apostles do, in the synagogue. Uh, but Priscilla and Aquila heard him. Remember Priscilla and Aquila, this couple that Paul lived with in Corinth, that had refugees from Rome, uh, Jewish Christians, they had traveled with Paul to Ephesus. Paul had left them there on the way back 
to uh, Antioch of Syria. <laughs> I'm getting all these names, these words mixed up. Priscilla and Aquila heard Apollos and they took him aside and they explained the way to, of God to him more accurately. You know, so in a sense, they, they fill the gaps in his knowledge. They help him understand and uh, deepen his knowledge of the teachings of Jesus. And obviously this will be Paul's way of teaching Jesus because Priscilla and Aquila have been with Paul so long. And obviously also uh, Apollos takes this to heart because he, he decided that he wanted to go over into Greece, into Achaia, which is the southern province of Greece, where Athens and Corinth are. And the believers in Ephesus, they encouraged him and they wrote to the disciples to welcome him. So here we see examples of the communities writing letters to each other. So it's not surprising that we have letters from Paul to the communities, from James to the communities, from John to the communities, from Peter. It, it, these letters were a way of keeping unity among all these communities. We saw the letter that the Church of Jerusalem sent to Antioch concerning, you know, observance of Jewish law. So another letter exchange here, a kind of letter of recommendation for Apollos. And we know from Paul's letters that Apollos will spend time in Corinth and he will be uh, an important man there. And uh, the last paragraph of today's reading points this out. On his arrival, Apollos' arrival, we can understand in Corinth, he greatly helped those who through grace had become believers, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Messiah is Jesus. Now let's remember, he himself is Jewish, so obviously the Jews he's speaking about that he's refuting, refuting in public are those who cannot accept that Jesus is Messiah. But by the use of scripture itself, he can kind of bring them, or at least refute their teachings that Jesus couldn't be the Messiah. He shows that to them. And in, in a sense that, you know, the, this refuting is done in public. It might have been humiliating for the, those who took the other side of the argument. But it shows his eloquence and his knowledge to the point that a lot of um, commentators have considered that he would be a prime candidate as the author of the letter to the Hebrews. Uh, the letter to the Hebrews, one of the texts in the New Testament, is we don't know who the author is. The author does not identify himself. Um, and there's nothing in the text that kind of can indicate who the author might be. But it's a text that is obviously addressed to Jewish Christians to help them bolster their faith by the use of the Jewish scriptures themselves. It's why it's such a hard text for us to understand because you really have to understand the Jewish scriptures to be able to understand the letter to the Hebrews. It's possible that Apollos wrote that. So let's leave Apollos there and we'll move to the Gospel of John. And here we're at uh, chapter 16, verse 23 to 28. We're at the last section of... Um, this third version of the farewell speech of Jesus. We'll read this last section in two parts, today and Monday. And after that, we'll have finished the long farewell or the three versions of Jesus' farewell speech. And we will enter into chapter 17, which tells us of Jesus' prayer the night before he died. It's a remarkable, remarkable text. But now we, we look at this uh, final part of the teaching of Jesus. And so he said to his disciples, so we pick it up at uh, the end of verse 23. Very truly, in Greek, amen, amen. This is always solemn when Jesus says this. So you have to listen clearly, when attentively when he says these words. I tell you, if you ask anything of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask, and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. Now, let's remember that this third version is written to uh, a community that is very uh, distraught, that is losing hope, uh, that is not sure that Jesus 
really is the risen Christ. They put their hope in that, but they don't see signs of it. And up to now, in this third version, we've seen Jesus speak to them about the Spirit who would come and help them understand the truth of all things and how he himself would make himself present to them and how the pain that they are going through is similar to the pain of a woman giving birth, you know, that there will be new life that comes out of this. And then now he says, and so ask, ask in my name and it will be given to you. And obviously what Jesus is speaking about here is ask for the grace to persevere, ask for the grace not to give up, ask for the grace to be renewed in your faith and, and in following me and your joy then will be complete. This is the third time in this text in the final discourse, in the three versions of it, that Jesus says, anything you ask of the Father, he will give it to you. And I've been thinking, how, how, can, how can we understand what it means to pray in the name of Jesus? And I'd like to propose an image to you. I mean, it's, it's, it's worth what it's worth, okay? But often when we pray and, and we think, I have to pray in the name of Jesus, I imagine somehow that... Uh, Jesus is between me and God, and I'm praying to Jesus, uh, to the Father, and I say, Jesus, bring my prayer to the Father. So Jesus is the, the intercessor. My prayer is brought to God the Father by Jesus. Um, or, or even we might think that Jesus is close to us, you know, maybe sitting next to us, and I'm praying to the Father, and I'm saying, you know, Jesus, help me pray right here, you know, help me pray in your name. I, I would like to suggest to you that it's even deeper than that. It would be like turning to Jesus, who's sitting next to me, and Jesus, and telling Jesus, Jesus, would you pray? You, you pray to the Father for me, and I will listen to your prayer. I will listen to your words. I will listen to what you ask for. I will listen to how you praise the Father. I will, I will listen to how you love the Father in your prayer. And I will make your words mine. I will make your worship mine. I will enter into your prayer, Jesus. Rather than trying to convince you to enter into mine, I will enter into yours. What would that look like? I, I invite you to try this imagination exercise, this imagery, you could say, the next few times you go to prayer, try to imagine Jesus sitting next to you and, and try to imagine Jesus praying on your behalf. How would Jesus pray? Enter into his prayer. And I think that's what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. And listen to what Jesus said, says now. Now, I've said these things to you in figures of speech. He's not talking just about what he's said that evening. I think he's talking about his whole teaching has been figures of speech, par parables. Not that he's not been clear, but that for us, they're like parables. For the disciples, for the apostles, the night before he died, looking back, these are all like parables because they haven't really understood anything, you know. It's, and all of John's gospel is like that, if you look at it, huh? You know, uh, Nicodemus, what does it mean to be born again? The Samaritan woman, give me of this water so I don't have to come to this well anymore. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the Jews coming to the multiplication of the bread and just looking to fill their stomachs. Uh, the apostles themselves having their feet washed, not understanding the meaning of it all. So it's as if everything is in parables. This is what Jesus is saying. The hour is coming, he's speaking of his resurrection and the gift of the Spirit. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures, but will tell you plainly of the Father. And why will he tell us plainly of the Father? Because it will be in the Spirit that this will be told to us. The Spirit will make us understand. He's, Jesus has said this a number of times in this feral speech. The, the Spirit will help us understand his words. And Jesus says, and I will tell you plainly of the Father. It, it really, in Greek it says, I will communicate to you everything of the Father. And if you say everything of the Father, it's not just things about the Father, but it's the Father's very being. I will communicate that to you. Uh, the, at the Second Vatican Council, I just 
want to take a moment here. At the Second Vatican Council, the bishops uh, of the world approved a text in 1965 at the last session about what is revelation? Before the council, Catholics and theologians, Catholic theologians, had a tendency to think of revelation as a series of truths that God has revealed to the world through his son Jesus. And to, to believe means to, you know, uh, hold on to these truths. Um, there, there was uh, an act of faith that we were taught as kids and in that act of faith we said i believe all the truths with with the whole which the holy catholic church teaches because you have revealed them you see it's truths propositions you know i believe yes that uh, god is a trinity that there's the father the son and the spirit because the church teaches it and i believe that the the, the son was incarnate in jesus christ and i believe that jesus died for our salvation that he rose from the dead and that he sent the spirit these are all things we believe propositions but what did the bishops at the council say about revelation they said in his goodness and wisdom god chose to reveal himself i'm sorry for the male adjective because god is not male god chose to reveal herself but god isn't female either how can we say these words god chose to reveal god's self but the being of God is what God wants us to discover. God's very being. And it goes on, the invisible God out of the abundance of love speaks to human beings as friends. So this is relationship. The point of revelation is not believing truths. The point of revelation is entering into relationship with God with God's very self, so that God may invite and take all human beings into fellowship with himself, with God's self. This is what Jesus is saying here, that the whole point of this is introduce them into a relationship with the Father. See, before, uh, before the resurrection, what was faith? Jesus always said, you know, you must believe, you must believe. What, did they, what were they called to believe? Believe that Jesus is the sent one of God, the one that the Father has sent. Because you believed that, I, that I've come, you know, from the Father. And, and he will say this, I'll read this in a moment. Because you have loved me and I've believed that I came from God. That's what they had to believe. But now after the resurrection, that faith is deepened. So now that faith is not only believing that uh, Jesus is sent by the Father, that faith is entering into relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ in his spirit. And so Jesus says to the point, on that day you, you will ask in my name. I, I do not say that I will ask the Father in your behalf, <laughs> you know, for the Father himself loves you. So in a sense, our unity with Jesus will be so deep that we will be able to use the words of Jesus himself, as I was saying, and we will be able to say those words and the Father will hear them from our lips. He hears them now from our lips if we pray in Jesus' name. You know, and the Father himself loves you. We, we saw, you know, in the speech to Nicodemus, God so loved the world that he sent his only son into the world so that the world, not to judge the world, but so that the world might be saved through him. He so loved the world. We've heard that. God loves the world. But here, Jesus says, the Father loves you. He earlier said, the Father loves me. <laughs> Speaking of Jesus himself. But now he's saying, and the Father loves you. If we are in Jesus, the Father loves you. I came from the Father, and you believe that I came from God. I came from the Father, I have come into the world, and now again, I'm leaving the world and I'm going to the Father. And by going to the Father, he gives us access to the Father because we go to the Father with him. In the Spirit right now, and in eternity, in, we can say, the flesh, because we do believe in the resurrection of the body. It's a remarkable uh, climax, you could say, to all this farewell speech. This is what it's all about. 
entering into friendship with the Godhead, with the Father, and living out of that friendship in love, filling us with joy. This is what Jesus was telling his apostles the night before he died. This is what John the Evangelist is trying to tell his community three generations later. And this is the message we need to hear today. With that, I leave you and I bless you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.